Okay, welcome to Rock Docs. Uh, this is a podcast about music documentaries. I'm David Lizabram. I'm Andrew Keats. And today we're going to talk about The Upsetter, The Life and Music of Lee Scratch Perry, which came out in 2008, I think, and directed by Ethan Higby and Adam Balalu. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing that right, Adam. Uh, if you're listening, feel free to come on and tell me I'm an idiot. Um, we are at Rock Docs Pod on the various socials, and uh, like all podcasters, we appreciate reviews and all that stuff. So if you feel like giving us a shout out, thanks for doing that. Um, before we get into that, there's been a little bit of Rock Doc news lately that yes. we wanted to address. Rock Doc news that uh, hits on something we've discussed on this very program. Yeah. People have been asking us to <laughs> to discuss this, mm-hmm. uh, to get our takes for posterity. Mm-hmm. Uh, the book Meet Me in the Bathroom came out maybe eight, ten years ago, something like that? No, not that long. 2017. Sure. It's five years ago. Five years ago. Um, it's about the uh, New York indie rock music scene of the early 2000s. Yeah. Bands like uh, the Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs, Interpol, LCD Sound System... And the Strokes. And the Strokes, right. And um, those are the main characters of the book. Those are the main characters. Some, some later chapters on the TV, on the radios. Yeah, and, your nationals. And Vampire Weekend. The National, sure. Right? Uh, and uh, I think that era of music was pretty seminal for me and to some extent maybe for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we were kind of the right age for it. Yeah. Um, and it seemed like a really big deal um, at the time. These like rock bands were coming out and it was super popular and so forth. Uh, this book came out then to kind of memorialize that or to, to you know, kind of establish the official history mm-hmm. of that era. It was like a, like a, what, what's the word for it? Like a spoken word history? What's the word for that kind oral of? Oral history. Oral history, yeah. yes. Yes, it's, a, it's an oral history. And they talked to a lot of people yeah. uh, between, you know, the sort of producers and promoters and graphic artists that prom- that wrote that made the band posters and, and the scenesters uh, and bloggers which were a new thing at the time yeah, sure and uh, and then even people like Mark Marin who has been quite open about the fact that he actually didn't follow any of these bands or this <laughs> scene at the time but, but whatever he's sort of known for being in New York around that time so I guess he made his way into the book uh, so yeah so they announced um, that the they've made a documentary about Essentially about the book, you know, yeah. or, you know, based on the book. Yeah. Coming They've out optioned this year. the book, right? It premiered earlier this year at the Virtual Sundance Festival. Yes. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, I mean, last season we talked about this book and how we'd like to see it made into, like, a series of rock docs or, you know, something like that. Yeah. It seems like it's going to be a little bit more limited than we had hoped. I think the, the way I gather it, it's basically going to be about the first half of the book. Mm-hmm. Which is more or less the 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 beginning part of New York when rock was dead and New York was was grimy but like not in a cool way yet. Yeah. And uh, the Strokes, the Yeah Yeah Yeahs, um, and Interpol were kind of on the way up, and right. LCD Sound System were on the way up. Yeah. Um, and. And then and sort of riding that crest and but then getting it sounds like they're going to get out of it by the pitchfork era. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the mid aughts where indie was everything. Right. And I guess at first I was like, wow, only like a hundred mi- minute movie to cover this whole thing. Right. That was a big deal in my life. Yeah. But I think maybe I had overestimated the popularity yeah. or demand. Yeah. For content about the yeah, yeah, yeahs or something that was like a big band to me mm-hmm, when I was mm-hmm. 25 or something. Right. But they're not the Beatles. No, no they're not. <laughs> and I mean, the, and like the Strokes seemed like such a big thing at the time. Yeah. And, you know, there's there's some sweet moments in the book where they sort of reflect on like that there was this moment that, that they were treated as this next huge thing. And that in retrospect, they sort of, sort of seem to have come to grips with the fact that... In the end, they were a big band, yeah, but not the biggest, and they didn't change music, right? You know, there were some bands that were certainly influenced by them, and 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 the and they were they were a big deal. They were enough to get this treatment, enough to be the the main characters of this book, and presumably the main characters of this movie. But it was not a, a second coming of rock and roll. Yeah, I mean, there's five people in the Strokes, as I remember, like when their debut album came out, Spin Magazine 
released five different covers <laughs> one of one epi- one issue, like f- for you know one featuring each band member, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it was just like that world doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, and they were kind of right at the end of it. It was right when like CD sales were still a bit a big thing. They caught the tail end of that, probably selling a lot of CDs totally of their first record. Yeah, uh, right. You know, as Napster was happening and streaming was you know on the horizon. And so, you know, they had their moment, but they never, they never were as big, I guess, to the rest of the world as they were to, like, me and you and a few other people. Thing to look for, does Ryan Adams make an appearance in this book, in this movie? Yeah. Because he's a central player in the book. Yes. Sort of as the, the guy who, if not ushers in, certainly expedites the downfall of the Strokes by yes. uh, allegedly getting Albert Hammond Jr. addicted to heroin. Yeah. And uh, he sort of had a meltdown on social media when this book came out about the way he was portrayed in it. Yeah. But then again, he has social media meltdowns often. In fact, I'm blocked by Ryan Adams. You are? Yes. Wow. Okay. (laughs) Tell me. Yeah. You're burying the lead here. Uh, It's it's actually a pretty stupid story. (laughs) Okay. It's a podcast. (laughs) A writer at my publication tweeted a, a very silly joke about somebody saying they were excited to see Ryan Adams. And he said, you should request Summer of 69. (laughs) And Ryan Adams got in his mentions and was like, this is bullying. And started adding the other editors at the publication, including me, (laughs) demanding that we fire the writer for, for bullying. And when I told him to chill out, he blocked me. (laughs) Okay. Wow. So there you go. Ryan Adams. A touch with greatness. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. That was, was a, a, a fun time. He okay. was he was quite serious, he seems like. At first, I thought he was doing an awesome bit, <laughs> following up on my friend and colleague's, like, okay bit. Yeah. And it became clear eventually that he was quite serious. He wanted us to fire him for, for bullying him. For making a accident, Ryan Adams, Brian pretending Adams Pretending to think that he was Brian Adams. Yes. Okay, Ryan. Ryan Adams, come. You're welcome. You're invited to come on the pod and defend yourself. Or, defend yourself. Yeah. Or tell Andy he's an asshole. That's or, fine. Or explain that it was an awesome bit. In which case, like <laughs> the the blocking of me really pushes it over. <laughs> Any take you want to have, we'll we'll yeah. hear it. You know, we, mm-hmm. we're um, yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, meet me in the bathroom. It's going to come out, I guess, later this year. We will certainly cover it. Mm-hmm. We're looking forward to it. And uh, let's talk about Lee Scratch Perry. <sighs> The Upsetter. The Upsetter. This film is quite an experience. Yeah. So I would say it's basically like 45 minutes is like a quite straightforward documentary. Mm-hmm. Now, not so much in the sense that doesn't have a lot of talking heads, but it's a pretty much straightforward rendition of his life. Tell us where he grew up, what happened to him. All right, let's just set the scene. Okay, Who is take... Lee Scratch Perry? Why is there a documentary about him? What is this movie? Lee Scratch Perry is a maybe the most influential producer, one of the most influential producers in the history of music, I think it's fair to say. Yes. Uh, certainly the most influential producer of reggae music. Yeah. Um, he is, to some degree, credited with creating reggae. Mm-hmm. This film makes that case. Sure. And then as later, as well as dub, and, and then later in, creating dub indirectly rap, and then indirectly rap. This movie, not all shot, of which is a big deal, and, and like one of the first uses of any sample. Yes, in 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 his first reggae song. Yes, uh, and then also goes on to produce a very important Clash record. Yeah. So, and he connects himself as a punk. Uh-huh. So if if creating. Reggae and dub and indirectly rap wasn't enough. Uh-huh. He caps it off by clarifying that he is a punk and you should yes. understand him as a punk. And he was there from the beginning. From the beginning. Yeah. So that's Lee Scratch Perry. Okay. Now, he's also... He uh, also, like, produced Bob Marley's biggest records. Yes. He's not, like, a guy that didn't do stuff. No. Yeah, he's... <laughs> he, he did some stuff. Yes, he was... And and this was isn't like a claim that came later in life. He was a international star. Yeah. Throughout the seventies. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And in late sixty, and then in the seventies. Yeah. 
And so there was a movie basically walks you through all of that in about 45 minutes, give or take. More or less. Benicio Del Toro is the narrator. Right. There's nobody else is interviewed in the movie other than Lee Perry himself. And then Benicio Del Toro speaks the narration. And it's not heavily narrated. He does not in no. the movie much. Just it's from time mo- to time, he just drops in with a little bit. Yeah. There's nobody else speaking to camera, et cetera. It's all just historical footage and then contemporary interviews and of the, a very old Lee Perry. Yes. And there's not even, there's not even like old found footage or, you know, uh, archival footage of people like Bob Marley talking. No. There's there's images of Bob Marley. There's footage of Bob Marley. Not even Bob Marley like working with Lee Scratch Perry. Right. It's just like it, footage of Bob Marley being Bob Marley. Right. And then later on, you know, people like Paul McCartney and Linda McCartney. Right. But there's no footage of like them or the Beastie Boys or anybody else he worked with talking about him. Not not at any point is is any other artist interviewed or. Is do they clip an interview from a magazine right. to give you some sort of context of what other artists thought about Lee Scratch Perry? Right. It's him talking about how he saw his work. Right. And if there's ever any need for any sort of universal view, that comes from Benicio del Toro quite sp- sparingly. Yes. Okay. So um, we talked about the first forty five minutes <laughs> is basically the story of his life through the you know fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties. He comes, he's from should we, the country. Should we go through some of those highlights? Let's get into it. Yeah. He comes from the country. He's a country boy. Yes. He Which did, he says a lot. He says a lot. Yeah. Basically a hillbilly. Mm-hmm. Uh, grew up dirt poor. Yeah. Not a great relationship with his parents. His dad treated him like a slave. Yeah. So he bailed. Went to work basically uh, driving a tractor, <clears throat> sort of paving the road to Negril, which was a resort yeah. that was popular in the 50s. And... Um, <laughs> this is just an all-time You're jumping rock. out of your seat here, so tell us what happens when <laughs> this, he's driving the tractor. This is he's never all- had anything to do with music. He's, he's driving a tractor. Yeah, what he's happens? a country guy who gets a job. He explains how music came into his life, which he says is from working with rocks. Yes, that, stones. The stones. That uh, This is a quote. I, I, I wrote this down word for word. If I wasn't in the grill, I wouldn't be a top producer because it was when I was working with the rock that I picked up these sonic vibrations. And I hear the rock, and when you throw the rock, it sounds just like when you hear the thunder roll. I'm sure that's where everything is coming from. So I hear in these sounds and the clash are like the drum. And in the wind, I hear when the cymbal hit. And I hear the rain, and I hear when the stone clash. And I hear the thunder roll, and I hear the lightning flash. That's why I come to get involved in the music business. I learn everything from Stone. So there's two things in there that we get from Lee Scratch Perry the rest of his life. A one, he gathers his incredibly unique uh, sense of music from the most elemental, yes, uh, uh, from uh, rocks, uh, from, from rocks clanging together. And two, you can hear there he's already like speaking in couplets. Yeah. You know, and and he does that throughout the movie, and you and you can hear the way he talks. It's a small skip and a jump to his lyrics. Yeah, you know, when he like so when he says, uh, "When I hear the stone clash and I hear the thunder roll and I hear the lightning flash," it's like he's extemporaneously speaking right in sing song lyrics. Yeah, I mean, his life is his art. Yes, he is a character, mm-hmm. and everything he says is in this kind of. Not just a very everything is sub that he says is subtitled because although it's a you know a dialect of English, he is nearly impossible to understand as for an American person who's not familiar with Jamaican speech to a great degree. Yeah, like there's just lots of parts if it was not subtitled, I would not know what he was talking about. Yeah, and and he speaks obliquely. Yeah, and everything is oblique. Everything is metaphorical. Yeah, very spiritual. Very spiritual. Uh, very earthy. Very very biblical specifically. Yeah, but also very humorous. Sort of like this. Oh. Very puckish. clever turns of phrase. Very impish, puckish. Yes. Impish comedy. Yes. Uh, he's sort of like a prankster. Yeah, he, he amuses himself He greatly. cracks himself up he a lot. He cracks himself up, yeah. Uh, a lot of dirty jokes. <laughs> Tons of dirty jokes. Yes. Not afraid to throw those out there. Um, and, and, yeah, but a little, a lot of that, a lot of Babylon, a lot of biblical uh, interpretation. Um, and he just is... Marcus Garvey and yeah, King Selassie. Po- yeah, certain political yeah. stuff. Um, but he, yeah, that's just the way he talks and the way he is. And just to kind of picture him, cause they're interviewing him and he's like 70, yeah. right? So he is 
very skinny. I mean, when he was a young man, he was super fit. Ripped up. And he still was always very slim. He has, at this point, like a dyed red beard and dyed red hair, like bright red. And yeah, not he, says, he says that he does that because he's a punk. Yeah, because he's a punk. And um, his uh, style of dress, I would say, is unconventional. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and, and he's usually... And spiritual, often. He's yeah. Got, a lot like, of medallions and things. Yeah. He's often interviewed in his studio, which is at this point in Switzerland, which is just covered wall to wall, floor to ceiling with his paintings and art and collage and just like a the whole the whole movie is a riot of color. Yes. There's just color coming at you all the time. Yeah. The visual impact of what this guy's doing is to me as strong as his music or very much related. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So he's he grows up poor. He hears the rock. And then what does he do? He goes and works as a janitor in these clubs or in these there's record studios clubs. yeah there's record studios there's early you know 50s era ska music in Jamaica right, like calypso type and music almost. calypso yeah calypso in uh, ska that's calypso mixed with jazz as as Benicio del Toro describes it and uh he goes to these these he goes to be a janitor and like it's not even quite like working his way up as much as he is just there and starts lending ideas and they start recording some of his songs. Yeah. He claims they just ripped him off. He he says, I never got any money for that. They didn't even put my name on it, but he starts giving them songs. He's like, they would have beat me up. I just a country boy. (laughs) Yeah. And then, and and so then very shortly after that, he says that he goes to the old church that he grew, grew up in. He picks up some spiritual vibrations there decides that he's going to make spiritual music as a result and he's going to leave the ska and the rock steady to the rest of the Jamaican musicians and he's going to make spiritual music and that is what becomes reggae. Right. And <laughs> so the movie tells it, next thing you know, he's People he's, Funny Boy is out there. Yeah, and he's out making reggae yeah. as a solo artist, as with the Upsetters, eventually with the Wailers, Bob Marley, etc. Yeah. Uh... And I mean, people, people, funny boy. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if you're like me, but I, uh, one of the first CDs I ever got in my life was like Bob Marley Legend, mm-hmm. when I was like, I don't know, third grade, sure. like in the earliest stages of showing any interest in music. That was something that somebody gave me. Right. And then probably the next thing I had after that was like a cheap reggae compilation mm-hmm. that I picked up somewhere for like five bucks at a sam goody or something gas station yeah some gas station compilation but people funny boy was on it okay so that's like one of the first reggae songs i ever school lee perry head (laughs) well but i mean uh, i guess what i don't know is is that a song that is people experience early on in liking reggae at all is that like a, a common first song once you've gone past bob marley you're asking the wrong guy at this like at this stage in life maybe yeah i don't know i mean you know I, I I mean, I think <clears throat> from what I understand, the history, mm-hmm. you know, the history doesn't record him uni- exclusively as the inventor of reggae. Right. You know, no, no, no. And the Maytals were doing their thing right yeah. around the same time. Right. There's other producers, Cox and Dodd and others yeah. around that time that were kind of converging on a sound. That's yeah. usually how these things happen. Yeah. It's, I mean, documentaries have this problem right. as a whole of your subject is your subject. You need to justify why you're telling him making a movie about him instead of anyone else. And so we were all doing the same thing at the same time becomes Jay Adams is the first skateboarder to ever ride vert in a pool. Right. And it's exactly. like, okay, I'm, you know, maybe a other people were riding skateboard. You know what I mean? Right. Another type of documentary would yeah. then have some talking head come in and say, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. This also yes. was going on, but certainly he was very important and influential, right. but this is just not that kind of movie. Right. This is just like getting inside his head and getting on his vibe. Yes. That's the point of this movie. It is funny to me that so they it's like not intended to be Wikipedia. It, no, it true, but it is funny to me that they like carefully caveat the idea that, uh, he is one of the first people to use a sample. Yeah, but they're not so so careful with like him inventing reggae, right? <laughs> you know, no, you yeah. know, like that is stated conclusively. Uh, but the 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 first use of a sample, which is a, a baby crying and people funny boy, yeah, is they're they're careful to say you know this wasn't the very first time anyone had done this, right? Exactly. So so he's you know becoming successful yeah. as an artist and as a producer mm-hmm. in the late sixties. Mm-hmm. 
Bob Marley, at this time, the Whalers, his group, was like basically a vocal group yeah. in the 60s. That it had some hits, but I guess he was saying... It's like hits in Jamaica. Yeah, sure. And and, and not like runaway hits. No, 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 no. He was another guy. He was, he was guy. not as big as Toots and the Maytales at that time. No. And then uh, I guess Marley came to him or something and was not sure what his next move was going to be. And Bob Marley wanted to play the guitar on stage. And uh, according to Perry, it seemed people fine with didn't want to let him pay, play the guitar on stage. Yeah. Doesn't explain what... what their specific I guess maybe issue they saw was. him just like as a vocal group, like yeah. you know, how we would see like the four tops or something. And he wanted to be a kind of more of a solo artist with the whalers behind him. Yeah. And be playing the guitar and kind of more in a rock vibe. Mm-hmm. Uh and 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 also Perry sort of takes credit for introducing the spiritual element to, to Bob. Bob Marley. Yeah. So he's this is this is a, a highlight portion of this movie. Yeah. He says that uh, him and Bob are living together. Right. Yes. Uh, and what's the living arrangement? He, Bob gets the front of the house. Yeah. Bob gets the front room. Bob gets the front room. That's his. That's for him. He take Lee takes the back room of, of his, own, his house. own house. He makes a big deal of this. Yes. He says he, so he viewed him as a brother. Uh huh. And there were so many spiritual vibrations going through his house. Yes. There was so much. Uh, so many messages flowing through the house that Lee knew he couldn't take them all in right anyway. Mm-hmm. So it only made sense to have Bob there, yeah, to pick up the uh, the rest of them. Sure, their, their their capacity for for receiving these messages was only so much. Bring Bob in there, you've doubled the capacity. We're, and so we're and recording so, this right now in my house. Yes, how much spiritual vibrations <laughs> do you think is going through the house right now? Moderate, <laughs> some, some. Not I, I, I wouldn't call it none. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know, I hear what you're saying, man. This is just the world that he lives in, though. I mean, it's a totally like. I mean, you could just kind of take a step back. Like you could kind of like watch this and kind of laugh at the guy because yeah. he is kind of comical. I mean, he's well, clear headed when he's talking about his youth. He's joking around and and whatever. But he, I mean, he's te- he's not a crazy person. He tells you what happened when the sequence of events makes sense. Without question. And even like the idea of, of him and Bob, you know, like I, we had a little fun with it just now, but like he's describing it in very spiritual terms. Right. But you could tell that version of the same story and have the same net effect as, you know, two writers saying we lived together at that time and we both just wrote morning to night. We were both inspired right. and energized. Yeah, sure. We were around each other. We're talking about all these things. And, you know, I wrote my first novel and he wrote 17 s- short stories right. in that in that uh, year we lived together or whatever. Right. And no one would bat an eye at it. So yeah. like, but he's a spiritual person. So he pitches it in spiritual, spiritual terms. Right. And I don't mean to be like sitting here dunking on his no, culture no, or whatever, no. or, you know, the, the, the worldview. That's mm-hmm. just the, that, it, you know, that's the context, and he has a sense of humor about stuff. Oh, so very it's much not so. Like he's 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 draw he, he's pretending to be dead serious about everything, and if you laugh about it, you're making fun of him. He's the butt of a joke. Like he, yeah, you know, is a very he's yeah he's just having fun with it himself. And so he says that uh, him and Bob, were, it was a, a the king and the prophet. Yeah, that's the framing. That there's always there's always two. He was the he was uh he was the prophet. And Bob was the king, or vice versa. No, yeah, Bob was the king. Bob was the king, and, and, and Lee, Lee was, was the, the prophet, prophet behind him. Yes. So the prophet is kind of like the crazy person yeah. in the wilderness with visions, yeah. who's like seeing the future and so forth. And the king is the person who can like go out in front of the people and lead them. Yeah. And 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 channel what the prophet is seeing into a way in a way that communicates to a wider audience. Yes. That's my understanding of the metaphor there. Yeah. And. Uh, mission accomplished, I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, Bob Marley. <laughs> there you go. Very popular guy who yes. did seem to reach quite a few people. Yes. So I guess he has Lee to thank for that. And so, you know, they uh, they go through the, the albums. And Benicio del Toro says that these albums were largely considered the best of Bob Marley's career. Maybe a little overstated, but I, I mostly agree. I think those are some of Bob Marley's best records, certainly. You're not so sure at all. I'm not really a Bob Marley fan or you don't, person oh, who likes Bob Marley, so I'm not the guy. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Pass, That's fine. Pass judgment on that. Okay. I know everybody likes him, and I'm not. If you person listening enjoy the music of Bob Marley, 
God enjoy bless. it. <laughs> Jobby with you. Yeah. That's cool. Great. Yeah. Not really my vibe, mm-hmm. but sure. Okay. Fair enough. But so then, uh, sort of like the first real sign of, of tension in Lee's life, he decides to sell the Whalers records to a UK distributor. Right. Which he says was done to get their music off the island to yeah. a broader audience. Also, mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. Maybe you could have run it by Bob. Uh, yeah. So, and then the Whalers don't like this. Yeah. Specifically, Bunny Whaler. Yeah. He sort of uh, alleges that Bunny Whaler is the one who, who was incensed by this and turned Bob against him. Right. Um, and There's a they, lot of people turning people against each other and bad spirits and duppies and things, right? which is some sort of ghost or demon. Yes. I'm not really sure. I felt like I could have understood that whole part better. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, the Whalers write Trenchtown Rock as a sort of... A, 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 a diss track. A diss track against, yeah. against, uh, um, against our friend Lee Scratch Perry. Yeah. And People Funny Boy was a diss track that Lee Scratch Perry wrote. Against Joe Gibb, his uh, the other previous Jamaican. This producer. is just a long tradition of, of dissing each other, dissing in, each other in, in song. In song, okay. Uh, and so the that blows up their relationship, and uh, they're not happy. And and Scratch Perry is, he says, you know, like atonement is good for the soul. Yeah, and that he acknowledges that he did that. Uh huh. No questions asked. Yeah. But he's also sort of. You know, he sort of caveats it a little bit by saying, Gu- guilty as charged. You guys became international celebrities because of me. Yeah. So he, he's not really apologizing in some ways. And he goes on to found his studio, Black Ark, which is this yes. famous studio. Um, the Ark of the Covenant. He calls yeah. it the Black Ark. Yes, in, in Jamaica. And he doesn't seem to have been slowed down by losing the biggest star in the world. He goes on to essentially, I mean, I don't think it's really disputed that he's credited as the inventor of dub yes which is maybe seems a little esoteric now but it's a big deal yeah that he really was one of the first people to to use the studio as the instrument i mean other people had done that people say that about the beatles or pink floyd or whoever but this was going beyond where he was producing other artists and then he would just take the songs that were produced and stretch them out and make and just issue alternate versions that were much longer and had, had all kinds of weird sound effects and layers of sound and, and you know, sci-fi-ish sounding, trippy, weird, um, paranoid stuff. Um, and, and was just, you know, again, not just your typical producer where, okay, the, the artist comes in, they sing the song, they do their thing, you record it, you issue it out, good, you're done. He was remixing it. In a, they didn't have the word remixing back then, but that's what he was doing and was taking the the basis of the recording, which might have been three minutes long, and turning it into this, like, you know, eight minutes or ten minutes or twelve minutes of weirdness and issuing them on his own label. And um, and producing a obscene amount of music during yes, this time. Yes, just Hundreds every day, of songs. Every day. Yeah. Tons of music. Yeah. Records coming out all the time. And this was very influential in terms of setting the stage for hip hop yeah. and electronic all, all music. All electronic music, basically. Yeah, just yeah. like, I mean, essentially, look, I think there's a case to be made that Lee Perry is like one of the 10 most important people in music in like the 20th century. Yeah. Like right now, as we stand, like the biggest thing in the world of music is Encanto, yes. right? Yeah. And, as parents of four-year-olds, you and I know it well. Yeah. But, like, that music is reggaeton. It's, you know, reggae type. It's hip-hop, etc. Yeah. Uh, that all is either directly comes back to Lee Perry or is influenced by him. Right. Uh, everything on the charts. The Super Bowl recently, you had, you know, rap and these, you know, very famous rap artists. There's no question, you know, Snoop Dogg is, like, a, a big reggae guy. Like, that's the biggest stage in the world. That's... All those guys would say Lee Perry was a big influence on them. Yeah, think about what the like the G funk sound is. It's basically exactly what you described, but the, exactly. the source material is different. Yeah, and there's right. a thou- you know there's a thousand different variations of this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, electronic music, whatever, all kinds of stuff that house it, music, right? Yeah, that is as popular as anything right now, yeah. all over the world, right. and not just again, you know, not just in Jamaica, not just even in America, but like pretty much most of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the, you know, these elements are what is popular. And um, 
that all goes back to him. Mm-hmm. You know, again, there's not that there wasn't other people involved, but he's, you know, he kind of stands head and shoulders above them. And, you know, whoever you want to say was the most important people in music in the 20th century, the Beatles or, uh, you know, uh, uh, Louis Armstrong, you know, yeah. that's the level of person we're talking about here. Yes. And yeah. I don't, you know, the movie doesn't really try to make that case exactly. Well, uh, well but I think, it, you know, I think it's true. They don't say, they don't come right out and say that, but I did put a timestamp that 27 minutes into this movie, the movie has claimed that Lee invented sampling, reggae, dub, made Bob Marley's best music, betrayed him, built his own temp studio, which allowed him to create rap. Yes. Okay. So, you know, they didn't say, and therefore, yeah, he's as important as any figure in the history of music. Right. But it kind of goes without saying if you've in 27 minutes made all of these claims. <laughs> okay. All right. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. he. Uh, so now we have the whole. You know, well, so uh, the the rap thing. I want to say. Yeah. Okay. So they 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 say that once he's put these dub once he's created these dub tracks, Lee and some of these other guys in Jamaica start doing sort of like making fun of each other and rhyming over top of them. Right. Toasting. Which they call toasting, and that that travels with Jamaican immigrants to New York City. Right, like into, DJ Cool Herc. Yes, into uh, the Bronx, into the Bronx and and Harlem, and eventually becomes about a decade later, rap. Yeah, exactly. So, so there you go. Now, you know the the chain of custody there. <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really in a position to take issue with anything. Exactly. Uh, I'm sure, and I'm sure there were other influences as well that 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 led to hip hop. But uh, we do know that it started in New York, and we do know that there were a lot of Jamaican immigrants in that area. And, right. He was, he, and, and, uh, but you know, he was certainly a was, proximate cause, as we would call it on the bar exam. Right. Exactly. And like you know, toasting is not altogether different than like the dozens game, which I often hear as a precursor to rap. Yeah. Right. None of these things have one one parent. Right. right yeah. Um, so anyway, so meanwhile, the whole Rasta vibe is happening. Mm-hmm. Um. Apparently, he's got this Black Ark studio. He's got this sort of, like, ranch or some kind of space that he has. And it's just, like, infested, <laughs> The more or less is the way he puts it, with Rastas. These Dreads just hanging out on his property, uh, causing violence, causing drama. He's paying off police. He's paying off guys. He's hiring soldiers to fight the police. Uh, They're all blackmailing him. They're all blackmailing Whoever he him. hires to protect him from, he hires the police to protect him from the thieves, they blackmail him. The thieves, he blackmail him to, to keep the, the, the corrupt police away. Right. He yeah. can't win for losing. Right. And He's Junior Mervin. He's getting sucked dry. Yeah. And Junior Mervin comes up with the idea to write a song to this called Police and Thieves. Right. Big hit. Major hit. Classic jam. Which makes its way into the hands of Joe Strummer. Right. Who not only loves it, but asks. Lee Scratch Perry to come out and produce their cover of it. Right. And a subsequent album. Right. And so meanwhile, like, I mean, he's producing this band, the Congos, which is like bringing apparently more of these dread reggae type guys, you know, Rasta type guys onto his property. The Congos album is great. Um, but that's Heart of the a Congos. fraught. Fantastic. It's called album. the Heart of the Congos. Unbelievably great. Yeah. That's a fraught situation too. Finally, he, although he never says, what did the Congos do? He he says the Congos were evil at one point. Right, he yes. had to get rid of them. Yeah, but we never get an indication of like what did the Congos do to him. Uh, I think he said they were devils. Yeah, he says they were devils, and I he mean, says what that he was. You need to know he was dealing with a certain type of reggae that hated white people. Right. Oh yeah. And the, he would by messing with them, he realized that he had brought hate into the studio. Yeah, he and that he yeah. should, he needed to atone for hating white people. Yeah, the anti-white v- flavor of uh, that era of reggae um lee was not down with or if he was down with it he realized the error of his ways yes and as a white person i'm gonna say thanks <laughs> shout out to you right. Lee perry yeah um so okay so he bounces to england and hooks up with the clash right around the time of their second out al- like the first album had come out right yeah. so now we're getting to give him enough rope the second album kind of a compilation yeah. um situation but they were breaking this is 77 yeah. i think yeah. Um, and I mean, yeah, this is like the biggest thing happening, certainly in England, is yeah. punk rock. Mm-hmm. And, you know, really probably barely has been heard of in America yeah. at this point. Right. But he's on it. And he produces The Clash. 
He loves it. He's he's all in. He calls himself a punk. Yeah. Um. And he, he just and Bo. By the way, we should mention that he burned down his studio. <laughs> yeah. Well, not yet. Not yet. And so so also at this point he uh, produces Linda McCartney's album. Yeah. Linda McCartney making her second appearance here on Rock Docs. Sure. Yeah. Of course. Um, yeah. She's famous from Get Back. Yes. You may remember her. Yeah. And uh, Paul's face is featured mm-hmm. in the movie. He's not does not discuss this. Although, frankly, I would love to hear Paul McCartney's views on Lee Scratch Perry. Yeah, I would love to hear that. Apparently, when Paul was busted in Japan for marijuana, yeah. Benicio del Toro makes a point of saying that Lee Perry wrote a letter to some official in Japan asking for Paul to be released. I don't Which know they don't how much say weight whether. that would carry, <laughs> but it's that cool that he wrote care. that letter. Yeah. It's, it may be the only letter he ever wrote. <laughs> Lee Sketch Perry wanted to really explain that like Paul wasn't selling no. ganja. He was just spiritual. He, he's a spiritual person. He needed it. Yeah. Which is, that's fine. I'm not sure Paul... At, at this point, needed to be selling gunch. <laughs> no, I don't. It seems I, like he was financially secure by now. Probably doing okay at that point. Um, so that, and then, you know, he's still got the Ark of the Covenant back home. Guys like Robert Palmer come down to. Oh, let me just, I forgot. I just want to, I just want to record. He said, uh, Paul is dealing with righteousness. Yes. That's his review of Paul McCartney. So, in case you were on the fence about Paul McCartney, <laughs> Lee, no Deal- lesser than Lee Scratch Perry said, Paul is dealing with righteousness. Dealing with the heaviest shit we got. Take that, George Stans. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So, Black Ark. Black. So, with all this, he comes back from recording all this stuff, and he is convinced that he has allowed evil to enter his studio because of the Congos, because of the dreads that he's allowed to infiltrate the property. Uh, again, it's not totally specific what they are doing but there's the sort of turf wars that are going on in jamaica at this point yeah there's a lot of violence in jamaica there's clips of that um fighting in the streets yeah and 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 so that's what the like the police and thieves is about in any case i think the whole thing with the dreads on his property was a tragedy of the commons type of situation yeah like it's just like kind of a communist vibe and uh, then all of a sudden nobody really wants to be organizing stuff yeah yeah and so he burns his own studio down to right. the ground. Well, first they say mysteriously the studio burned down. Right. I think that was the story for a while, but he finally copped to it. And then almost immediately afterwards, he says, I had to burn the studio down because there were <laughs> evil spirits there. <laughs> and he explains that fire is the only thing that kills evil spirits. And so he burns the studio down. Right. I mean, he says most of the dreads are a joke, meaning yeah. like he's saying, like, if you're going to pretend to be this Rasta dread guy. You have to be righteous, and you have to be spiritually pure yeah. and true. And, and they were the opposite of that. All they were doing right. was just smoking These ganja. These guys are just smoking ganja all the time, messing around, mm-hmm. like, you know, having sex, doing this, that, and the other, doing coke, doing all kinds of drugs. So that's a shout-out to all these Trustafarians out there yeah. and wannabe Rastas yeah. who uh, probably are a joke in the eye of Reese Scotch Perry. If you're really a dread and spiritual, uh, you know, show it, man. Yeah. yeah. Be righteous. That's my message to the dread <laughs> yes so he, so he burns this place to the ground and he sort of then serves to his life is in turmoil this is like the first 45 minutes in the movie that we've alluded we've, to we just got to the first yeah that's yes. the we're halfway i think it took through. us more than 45 minutes to narrate what happened but okay and he like at this point you just have long long stretches of footage of a man who mostly seems like he's kind of lost his mind yes for long narrated sort of um i don't know like like he's pitching his own camera and painting some little backdrop and then doing uh like a spoken word type thing yeah there's video footage of him video from footage the 80s him. various different times and like he seems Little office rocker. Yeah, he a records a song called "I Am a Madman." He it does a recording of like Daniel saw the stone, which is bad. Yeah, say what you will about all of this stuff that we've talked about. Every piece of music that they play from Lee Scratch Perry throughout the whole movie is like brilliantly good. Yeah, and then there's this Daniel saw the stone thing that which is like is rough. It's rough. I mean, it's 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 a a guy who's who's lost his mind i think yeah i mean he moved to london and 
was basically seems to have been living in an apartment, had lost all his money. His mm. wife left him for a roadie or something. A uh, studio musician. A studio, yes. Yeah, a studio musician. <laughs> seems like kind of a disc from <laughs> Benicio. It, it, it almost is like spit out of Benicio's <laughs> mouth. And his wife left like, him for a studio musician. What could be worse? <laughs> Someone who wouldn't have the sense of dub music and the <laughs> <laughs> bit him in the ass. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's there's the lost years, mm-hmm. and um, it basically seems like he's he painting goes a lot. He's he is painting uncontrollably. Yeah. And they they you see some of the paintings. It's I I mean it's I would say it's not a far cry from it's it's basically is like what you would expect if you went into a crazy person's house and saw that they had been painting on the walls. Right. Like it's just nonsensical words and images no meaning it's not good it's not it's not he's not painting like abstract art there's not it doesn't appear like one of the paintings is just a dick right going towards like like next to king Selassie's face he's just yeah i mean i feel like he's a guy where like the line between reality and madness yeah is always a thing with him yeah and there was a time where he was on the right wavelength and he could control it. Mm-hmm. And he was channeling that to create an endless volume of awesome music and art and, yeah. you know, creating culture and inventing new forms of music. Yeah. And there was a time when it was just, he was just not on the vibe mm-hmm. and the, or the world wasn't with him yeah. and he was uh, struggling. Yeah. That, yeah, exactly. And, and basically it seems like it lasted for the eighties. Yeah. More or less. Um, and then he meets his wife, uh, meets a, a, a third wife Yeah. in 89, yeah. Like a Swiss in a woman store. in, yeah, in a record store in, uh, it's a, a Swiss woman, Swiss billionaire. They get married in 91. She was rich. I didn't know this. Okay. Yeah. They and just mentioned her. Yeah. She's, again, she's not, she, you never, you see like a, a click, a quick video clip of her. She, yeah, they it's like, kind of seems like maybe we're about to hear from her. But and again, we don't hear see, from anyone else in this yeah, movie but Lee. You don't really hear that much about the wife at all. No. And he moves to Switzerland with her. Yes. And so, which makes sense now because throughout the first, we didn't mention this, but throughout the first 45 minutes, there's intermittent clips of him playing in the snow. Yeah. Right. And, and it's always like, like what's going, what is all this snow about? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's because he, he lives in Switzerland now. Right. Yeah. So the cruise I took that took me to Jamaica did not <laughs> did feature not any, any snow. Any snow. Like. <laughs> um, we should also say, by the way, at some point in this, he talks about Bob Arley dies. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And um, they ask him about that. And uh, so he and Bob Arley had gotten back together later in the 70s and did some more recording together. Yes. And then in the early 80s, Bob Marley dies, and Perry says basically that, and he seems very sincere to say that Bob Marley was lucky that he died yeah. um, to save him from, quote, vampires and parasites. Yeah. Um, he had so many people to pay off, yeah. all these gunmen, um, drug men, et cetera, that he's just much better off being dead. Yeah. And he's just saying that to the camera straight-faced. And he almost seems like he takes a great sense of relief out of it. Yeah. The, the viewing it this way. Yeah. That like, like he didn't mourn Bob Marley's death. Like he was happy that Bob was freed from all of these these hackles of, of fame. Yeah. And it's interesting because like everybody else in the world who knew Bob Marley much less yeah. than Lee Perry look at it, his death as a tragedy. And even, yeah. I'm like, I'm not a big fan of the guy, but I certainly regret his early death. Um, I can't believe you're not a big fan of Bob Marley. And it's he... Crazy. Uh, just absolutely crazy. And he... Uh, Drop it so casually. I've known you for so long. I never had this idea. But go ahead. It's fine. And we don't he, need to dwell on it. Yeah, it's fine. Um, it, you know, it's it's nothing I'm ashamed of. I, no, it's fine. <laughs> it's not like... I'm, I have things I don't like that I am ashamed of. I'll, I'll drip them out over the course of the show. Um, yeah, but... He, uh, yeah, Lee Perry, a person who worked as closely with Bob Marley as anybody and knew him yeah. for years and years and years... Doesn't seem to regret his death at all and thinks that, like, he just was not in a good place. Like, the, he was not in a good scene. Yeah. And he was relieved of that. Yeah. And uh, it's just a different take on the death of Bob Marley than you get anywhere else. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So he marries this woman. He moves to Switzerland. And according to Benicio del Toro, like, the world has forgotten him. People, yeah. there's rumors that he's dead. Yeah. He's now, like, long since past his days as a hit maker and everything. Right. Uh, but he was plotting his return. Yes. I'm not sure how much plotting was involved. But there was a return. Yes. He started making music again. Yeah. And it was good again. Yeah. Like 
right away. He builds the Blue Ark in yeah. Switzerland. Yeah. A new Ark. Um, and he, yeah, I mean, he starts uh, connecting with artists. He fe- is featured heavily on Hello Nasty, Beastie Boys. Right. What year did that come at? 98? 98, yep. 90, mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he's, yeah, and he was kind of, I think, talked about a lot before then. Because I remember yeah. when that came out, 98. Um, and, you know, I was a big Beastie Boys fan, but like, it wasn't like, to me, it wasn't like, who's this guy who's featured here, you know, whatever. And I was 22. Um, it was like, oh yeah, Lee Perry, sure. That makes sense that they would work with him because he's kind of a guy who's around and is doing interesting things and like was really popular in the sixties and seventies. So like he'd already kind of started his career revival by then. Yeah. And, and even the Beastie Boys, the name of that track is Dr. Lee PhD. Right. Is like. You know, it's, a, it's right a, a reverent position. Right, it's saying, "Hey, look, everybody, look who we got. This is yeah, this is and this is the guy. You're supposed to pay attention. Yeah. This is important, right? Um, and so, and then you know, he uh, he does a Guinness commercial. He, yes, he does a Guinness car commercial, which I do remember. That seems like a little bit like a self parody. Like he's yeah, just saying but like crazy he's stuff in on the joke from space. Yeah, but he's in on the joke. I think he's in on the joke, but I feel like Joe guy who's watching football and doesn't that commercial know yeah, comes that's 100 percent true the, the the it's positioned to make fun of him like here's this crazy talking guy from jamaica this weird old dude yeah so that's like a wizard kind of almost well and so then i guess that maybe brings us to the weirdest part of this movie which i really don't like is this long scene in a san francisco tourist shop yeah this is almost the very end of the movie and the yeah. oddest choice it is such an odd choice to include this it's like so lee scratch perry is in like a knickknack tourist store he's touring he's He's he's, gotten clean yeah he's totally clean and sober yeah he's touring as a solo musician in america which he never really did before yeah playing clubs you know big size clubs right which yeah i mean you know just imagine yeah 10 years ago 15 years ago if lee scratch perry was touring yeah you would go see it right oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. it's like this is gonna be cool interesting it's gonna be different yeah okay. so he's playing these shows and he goes into the like some stupid i love san francisco type snow globe store the tackiest of tourist shops he, yes and he's being silly he's being lee scratch perry yeah he's, he's joking around he's joking around he's talking he's got like a you know a inner monologue that he's just speaking aloud <laughs> to to anyone anybody and some asshole guy takes exception to it. Yeah. In what, you know, I don't think it's much of a leap to call like a pretty racist reaction. Yes. And like a, like he treats him like a crazy homeless guy or something. Yeah. You know, like he, he just sneers at him and then he says, you're bullshit. Right. Well, he's like, where are you from? And Lee Perry's like, what does he say? Like, I'm from heaven. Yes, I'm from heaven. That's yeah. just the way he talks. And he's he's clearly like... He's being playful. He's, he's being, being playful and also sized up this, like, middle-aged meathead from Canada as, like, whatever. Yes. Some loser that he doesn't need to pay attention to anyway. Exactly. And so he's, he, he's having fun at this guy's expense. Right. Who thinks he's having fun at Lee Perry's expense, but, like, in... in like a very mean way. Yeah. Like a, a very hateful way. Right. Like you, I should, you, why are you even t- in my world? Yes. Why are you even in my world? Like I'm in San Francisco on a very important insurance convention. <laughs> right. And so the camera's on this and we just watched the whole, it's like a 10 minute exchange yeah. or at least it feels like 10 minutes. Maybe if you set your clock to it, it's only four minutes, but it's in so, a movie. It's a long time. It's so uncomfortable. It feels like it lasts a long time and they go back and forth and, the guy just keeps escalating and getting more and more hateful. Right. Lee, for a while, doesn't take the bait and then eventually does and, like, basically calls the guy fat. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I mean, Lee, like, Lee shreds him. Right. Lee comes across as clearly smarter than him, right. clearly nicer than him. Yeah. Clearly with the appropriate worldview. <laughs> right. And the other guy if he saw this or if his family saw this would have to be absolutely humiliated right at his, the the human he's become. Right. I mean, this is like, this is like a nightmare to me is like, you get to see yourself on footage and you're like, Oh my God, I'm the asshole in the world. 
Right, exactly. I'm, I'm the one who goes out in the world and acts like that. Like, this guy, if he sees this, should feel like trash. I mean, the fact that the person he's mocking yeah. is one of the most important music producers of all time is beside the it's point. It's actually besides the point. It doesn't matter. The point is he's just treating this person yes. like garbage for no reason. Right. And so, like, Lee wins the exchange. Right. So that's not the, the issue. But I just don't know why I had to see it. Yeah, I don't know what it does. Almost the last scene in the movie. Yeah, I don't know what it doesn't. It doesn't. I don't think it teaches me anything more about Lee Scratch Perry, his life today, who he is. I'm, I'm unsurprised that he's capable of, you know, slicing and dicing some meathead asshole right. in a store. Right. He's a genius. Of course, he can do that. And he's seen tougher. Tough, yeah. People like, from the time he was three. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he lived through wars in Jamaica. Right. And all this drama for 70 years. He's not impressed or intimidated by this idiot. Yeah. And he and he doesn't, I mean, he doesn't even blink. When the, when the guy's clearly getting confrontational, he doesn't even blink. So look, it's not, Lee wins the exchange. Yes. But it's just such a strange thing for this documentary to include at such length. Yeah. I mean, I think it just kind of goes to the theory that, like, that we have. That sometimes when you're making a documentary, you just got what you got. And if you have some footage that's kind of interesting, it's hard to leave it out. Yeah. Because that's what it is. It's like, here's some interesting footage. It's a documentary. Right. Right? Like, yeah. I mean. Like, what am I going to do? Cut this out? I Lee Scratch Perry almost like, got in a fight in a San Francisco kit shop. I just don't. I feel like the movie didn't really have an ending that yeah. much. Yeah. Which is fine. Uh you know, the ending was like he's out there touring and he's doing his thing. Right. And he's old and he's cool. Um, but they could have talked to some other people about his lasting influence or something like that. But they've clearly that, made a decision not to. That would have been a different movie. Well, so let me ask. Let, let, let maybe change gears here. We discussed the fact that that's a decision that this movie made. Yes. What do you think about that decision? Do you, Do you like it? The decision not to contextualize the, the, him? To not to contextualize him and to go with the only... This is a movie of Lee Scratch Perry. He is the only voice that we get talking about Lee Scratch Perry. I mean, I don't... I don't mind it. When I was watching it the first time... I watched it a couple of times for this. Mm -hmm. When I watched it the first time, I, I was like... I did kind of feel like, well, maybe it wouldn't be so bad if we had a little bit more context here and yeah. like people telling me what's going on because I'm not an expert in this music or, yeah. you know, I don't know. Um, but at the end of it, I was like, well, I just spent an hour and a half like on the vibe of this very interesting, very funny, yeah. weird, creative, genius madman yeah. a person who's lived through a lot of interesting history. Yeah. Uh, who's just laying it all out there and being surrounded by his music and his art in the world. And just the whole, I mean, not that this is an answer to your question, but just like as a side, like especially for the first 45 minutes of the movie, like the 50s, 60s, 70s, everybody that he was surrounded by, every single person that he encountered yeah. and the whole context around him, everybody looked really cool yes, yes. <laughs> there's nobody yeah. in jamaica as far as i can tell between 1950 yeah. and 1980 who was not pulling it off yes like who was just not crushing it every yeah. like there's random people in the street there's just tons of footage of jamaica mm -hmm. the, whatever yeah in the, the era footage where people of the, like, kind of wearing suits to like the rasta or to whatever yeah fighting in the streets like the revolutionaries fighting in the streets they were sexy like they were just <laughs> cool everybody was cool i don't know yeah. just lived in a really cool weird world yeah. So I kind of like that, I guess, is the answer. It's just like... I think I like it, too. And I think I like it... There's in, enough of the documentaries with Dave I, Grohl rolling in to tell me something. I think that's it. I think I think the two ways to say it are, one is, there's if you're watching a lot of documentaries, it's nice to get a total change of pace. Right. And this is that. Yeah. And the second is, as like a bit of a lesson for those movies, is that you kind of don't need all that. You like l pull back a little bit sometimes, you know. You you don't necessarily need five contemporary musicians telling you just how important this guy was, you know. Like Benicio says, like three sentences about how important he is, and I'm totally sold on it. 
Maybe you just I, get Benicio del Toro in your documentary yeah. to say something because if he says something, I believe it. How many how many <laughs> hours of work do you think Benicio del Toro was paid for for this movie? I mean, it seems like he's if you just did a cut of everything he says in the movie, it's got to be less than four minutes. It's so sparse. Yeah, four or five minutes. <laughs> Maybe. And if they if if they cut if they cut five minutes for every one minute that they included, yeah, that's an hour of work. It's or whatever. An hour of work for Benicio. I hope that man, he must've been a good payday for him. Yeah, man. I don't know. Good yeah. for him. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. The guy's got an Oscar. He's whatever. Yeah. Maybe yeah. he's just like down to do this. Totally. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, is this cut- the first, is this the first celebrity narrator we've covered? Hmm. I that was think like so. that was like a real thing in in uh, early two thousands documentaries. Yeah, a lot of like like I, I mentioned I obliquely referenced Dogtown and Z Boys earlier. Yeah, it's like sure. Sean Penn. Right, right, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think it is, and yeah. I mean, this came out about ten years. What did what did I say? Two thousand eight. Yeah. So it's now it's like fourteen years old. Yeah. So it's not from the peak rock doc era that we're living in now. No, this pretty. is definitely in the proto rock doc. Yes. Uh, I don't really remember. I kind of vaguely remember when this came out, but I didn't. It didn't. Wasn't really on my radar. Yeah, I think it was. You you probably had to had to like be tuned. You had to be dialed into this stuff to yeah. to pick this up in two thousand. Yeah, I was too busy not liking Bob Marley at that time. Too. Um. So yeah. So um, and it would. It, it recently came was released on the Criterion Channel. Yes. So this is our second Criterion movie yes. after Buena Vista Social Club. Yes. Um and uh yeah and 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 so that's how we both caught it. So if you listener have listened to all of this and you're like, well maybe I should watch this movie now. It's on the Criterion channel. That's where it's found. Yeah. Um it's on and, Vimeo as well. Okay. You can rent um, it there. So uh I guess the question is uh somebody is not doesn't know a lot about Lee Perry or reggae or any of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh just interested to see a movie would you recommend this movie to them less so than some okay i think i think the last 45 minutes will would be tough for a lot of people it's kind of a tough hang yeah it's i mean it's sort of a long look into somebody who's going through a tough time Mm -hmm. like i texted you when i was watching it i was like sorry i'm watching apocalypse now i mean uh, the upsetter yeah exactly. you know like it's it's it, it's it seems like the end of apocalypse now well yeah because you it's also not the type of thing where like everybody knows the story so like you probably hear the rain now right yeah oh, this uh, is like heavy this is this is heavy vibes we are in san diego and it has just started to rain pretty hard yeah and both Leap. dave and i widened our eyes <laughs> and got got concerned this is lee perry himself coming from heaven yes Right. sharing the sound of the thunder yeah and this like if we were on his wavelength we would hear this and just immediately invent a new style of music yeah my four-year-old son could hear this and be like and that's how i got into music <laughs> it, it rained um yeah i mean the the, the thing it, yeah it's not like one of these movies where it's like you know tina turner or whatever where everybody knows the story in some yeah. sense and knows that she went through this tough time and then became a superstar yeah so it's not like there's a payoff that you know you're going to get. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's kind of what makes the like lost years a little bit difficult the first time you're watching this because you don't know that you're that you're that it's going to all come out and be okay. Right. I mean, you see him talking as an older man, but he's you know, it takes a while to kind of get on his vibe, so Yeah. They don't really they don't yeah, they don't you don't know what you're going to get. And you don't really get a big triumph at the end. No, it's not that kind no, of like I mean, feel it ends, good. It ends with this weird fight in San Francisco, man. Yeah. It's crazy. Well, it kind of ends with him like driving a van. Yeah, sure. <laughs> just I'm talking so, about stuff. I'm He's so just a confu- dude who talks about stuff. But like, man, if you if you're if I'm talking to the kind of person mm-hmm. who I think would be into this and would just find him amusing, entertaining, charming, whatever, which he is, he is those things, and the and you know the story of his influence in music and that is played out completely over forty five minutes, and. There's a lot of music in this, we should say. We often talk about how much music is actually in these documentaries. Yeah. This one has a lot of music. Wall-to-wall music. And, and you know, has a little, like, uh, MTV music video uh, identifiers on each time. So if you are just, like, trying to get more into, into reggae, you could come out with a sick playlist just yeah. by watching this movie. 
Uh, yeah, so I would recommend this if I knew it was the right person. Yes. Or I would contextualize and say, okay, the first 45 minutes is this, historical, yeah. interesting, blah, blah, blah. The last 45 minutes, like, it's a different kind of hang. So like it depends what you're Trip through the mind of a crazy person, yeah. uh, like a, a super genius, too. Yeah. yeah so, um, That's good. so, yeah, I, I think I would have to kind of contextualize it, but I enjoyed it. Oh, I loved it. I loved it. I'll watch this movie. I've watched it three times since we uh, decided to cover it, and I'll... I'll watch it a handful more times in my life. Okay. Yeah. Uh, did I mention? Do you care for? Are you are you a Bob Marley guy? <laughs> I can't believe <laughs> you're one of those rare people that likes how, Bob Marley. How unassuming you are about that revelation! I feel like there's a lot. You, of people did who you don't. Tr- go come into this episode thinking that you could like not mention it? That like there was a, a world in which you could you just skate right by? I feel like it was going to probably come up. <laughs> Yeah, I would say it's it's a, it's so it's a like good maybe bet. I, maybe I'll slip this by and Andy won't know. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, well, I know, I've man. I've still been. I'm iron like the lion of Zion. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> well, I, I I'm going to continue to conceal my my shameful musical dislikes f- up until the last possible moment. So I understand where you come from. <laughs> that's good. That's good content because yeah. then people are going to tune in. Maybe we'll like, hear what, what, that who does he doesn't hate? like ice cream or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Whatever that may be. Yeah. Um, all right. Cool. Uh, yeah. Follow us on social at Rock Docs Pod. Uh, like and subscribe or whatever you're supposed to do. I don't know. Uh, yeah, give us a rating and review and stuff like that. Tell a friend if you like this, etc. Enjoy the music of Lee Scratch Perry because it endures and it's awesome. That's right. And um, if you're that guy in Canada who is fighting with him and you hear this, come on. We'll have you on. <laughs> Defend yourself. Maybe you're just having a bad day. Maybe you're not really that guy. Yeah, I'm not really ready for you to be redeemed, but no. I guess I'm, Let's I should be open to it. Let's have that guy and Ryan Adams yeah. as a special guest <laughs> episode talking. Yeah, yeah it's going to be real interesting. Yeah. That's what we got coming up for you on Rock Dogs.